So uh, Midwest Inland Port, um, it started off as um, a study, an economic study that we did internally in transportation. And one of the business units uh, came to us and they said, hey, you know what, we need to put warehouse space, how many of you sound familiar in this, but put warehouse space on the East Coast and the West Coast and the Center Gulf. And I said, why do we want to do that? We want to be closer to the customers number one, and number two, we want to have readily access to empty containers to be able to put our product in there. Okay, and so as they started telling me their process, um, the first thing that came up as, as a trader and risk manager that I've always done all my life and all my career was we said, when you, when you take this product and you start moving it to Los Angeles and you warehouse it in Los Angeles, if Europe becomes your market, you can't move back or you can't arbitrage back to the east. Well, you can, but it costs you a lot of money, right? And we said, if you go to the east with all your product, and then all of a sudden the Asia is your market, it's much cheaper to continue to go out via LA Long Beach to go to Asia than to go around or through the canal to get there. So our question then was, is that really what you wanted to do? And they said, yes, study it. So we began to study, and what we found out was that what we have here in central Illinois is really unique and we'll share the story with you and we hope you think it's unique as we do because our strategy became real it was to get to any customer anytime anywhere that was the strategy we had and that's the strategy we still have today believe it or not um, after we built the ramp you know how things change it didn't quite change and it stayed right on right on a part of what we were trying to do so that was the strategy of why we build it. So let me start off by saying that um, I didn't grow up in this region. And so when, I, when you normally grow up in a region, you, you generally have a passion for the area. But what I have is passion for agriculture. To be able to get to those products to any customer, anytime, anywhere in the world to those customers. And transportation connects that. And when I talk about what we have here, um, I always, I, I've been starting off the last couple months by telling um, about three or four months ago, I gave the presentation I'm going to give you folks, and a lady got to the end of it, and, and it was a large group, a couple hundred people, about, yeah, a couple hundred people, and she said, Mark, I get it, it really makes rational sense what you're trying to do, but I've lived in Decatur for, you know, 30-some years, and I've heard the story three times that we're going to make an economic rebound, we're going to turn it around. Every time the economy starts going, things feel good, then all of a sudden, guess what happens? We hit a cliff, economy sets back, and all of a sudden, people pull back, they scale back, and we lose jobs. I've heard it three times. What's the difference? What's the difference you're telling me? And I thought, golly, that's, that's, that's a great question. And this is how I responded to it. Kind of fast forward to the end, I'll give you the cliff notes. I said, you know, that's a great question. Here's what I see the difference. Just like everything else, how it's evolved, transportation now has its time. Think back 30 years ago, how transportation worked. It was basically managed by a transportation manager. And that person knew the truck dispatchers and the railroads, and they knew how to get that piece of, uh, or that, that freight moved in and out of their system for their supply chain. And they executed, right? It was transportation execution. But think just like how people and generations evolved from the baby boomers to Gen X to Gen Y, transportation slowly have done the same evolution. So we've gone from transportation management 20 some years ago to today, or, or, or then it went into supply chain management, right? That was, that was the big deal, supply chain management. And that was pretty creative. Um, we were basically going to supply, uh, manage supply chains for large retail companies on a global perspective, and that's how it all started. And then all these NVOCCs and freight forwarders came up with supply chain managements. And then um, still today, uh, some companies are still using this, a uh, majority of them, called transportation supply chain solutions, right? We're trying to figure out what we're doing with our supply chain. We're trying to suppress cost structure. And we think it's even one step further than that. Think about Gen Y. Gen Y by 2020 is going to be roughly half of the workforce. These folks pick their phone up 
about nine point, I, I, every nine uh, minutes they pick up their phone, roughly. They want information now, they use that information now. We all tend to do it, we want to know something, we Google it, we, we, we want it instantaneously. And so our thought process is even changing in our supply chains, and now we, it's really called transportation engineering, or knowledge engineering, the way we're looking at our supply chains. Because they're always changing. They're multimodal. Now think about the people you're hiring in transportation today also. I started with ADM 23 years ago. When, we, when you started in the company, the number one spot to be was a corn trader on the second floor. The second floor is about 300 and some people. It's really high energy. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just dynamic. You want to be in the center of that trading floor as a corn trader. There was a little division um, along the wall, real close to the door, called transportation, and they executed. And the last place you wanted to be 23 years ago was in transportation because you either were going to retire in six months and they didn't know where to put you, or you really ticked somebody off and you had to get put in transportation before they figured out what to do with you. Today, that whole thing's changing. Now we're trying to look for the brightest and best people we possibly can to be able to come up with, you know, to, to create solutions under our knowledge engineering scope. We're not a single mode transportation, we're a multi mode. And when we talk about the inner, inner, uh, Midwest Inland Port, it isn't a single mode of transportation. What we've created is a multi mode uh, transportation gateway. So that's how I answered her question, kind of the long version. And she kind of looked at me, and I didn't know if she got it all. Um, afterwards, she came up to me, and she says, that makes sense to me. And when we show you our network that we have in Central Illinois that you have um, access to, I want to I stress this. This transportation network is not trying to compete with Chicago. It's not trying to compete with Decatur or Champaign or Bloomington or Peoria. We're trying to complement it. Because, see, there's a real press going on right now um, about Chicago. There's seven Class I railroads in North America. Those are the majors, right? Norfolk Southern, the CSX, the CN, the UP, the KCS. They're the large Class I railroads. They all end up in Chicago. Chicago is a great location because that, they, they end up there. The problem is, is they may be 50 or 60 miles apart from one another, but they all end up there. So it's a natural location for the Western Railroads to hand off to the Eastern Railroads to work east and the Eastern Railroads to hand off to the Western Railroads to go west. We all know about Chicago. There's two seasons, winter and construction. And we also know that, it, how many of you handle rail cars and transportation for your business? How was your service this past winter? It was okay? Have you seen it better? I don't use it that often, but maybe more. The worst year ever. I'm sorry? The worst year ever. Worst year ever. You're exactly right. Um, we probably need to get with you, <laughs> get some help. I want to know his Yeah. <laughs> I got lucky. Jennifer, get his resume. Um, <laughs> it, in fairness, it, it was one of the, um, it was a real tough year. For, the, for North American railroads. Um, obviously the winter um, started this whole thing. Um, they never really caught up. And then, and then guess what's happening? It's, it's ever so quietly happening. We're seeing the economy um, in jobs and in manufacturing. Everything's just starting to hit on all cylinders. The railroads are starting to haul coal again. You, you've seen the manufacturing sector where they're importing and exporting. So our exports are good, our imports are good. Um, the retail sector's uh, actually pretty decent. And, and you're feeling the railroads still not recovered from what happened. And of course, now there's a lot of issue going on that, hey, wait a second, guys. Um, you know, you class one railroads have caused a lot of problems for a lot of people. Now we're going to have a bunch of hearings and we're going to find out what's going on. Of course, the first thing they're talking about is weather. The second thing they're talking about is really bad congestion in Chicago. It's getting press everywhere. What we don't want to have happen as a state of Illinois is all of our rail freight, which is our, uh, huge to our economy, move elsewhere. We don't want that density to move out. I mean, there's places like Indianapolis and Memphis, believe it or not, because they connect the East and West Railroads together, St. Louis and Kansas City that would love 
to be able to take what Chicago has. And unfortunately, we need that revenue. And we don't want that to, ha you know, to go out of the state. There's a lot of people that are doing a lot of things because right now the momentum's on their side. We also are trying to do something downstate. We're trying to uh, work with a lot of folks to move freight in this direction to keep it in the state. The last thing I'd want to see is all that freight that goes through here um, move to Memphis or Kansas City. Because that density creates revenue, creates jobs, creates, I mean, that's part of the reason that Walmart comes here and Target and, um, you know, Michelin just uh, announced a big distribution center up there in Joliet also. They come here because there's density in their schedules and the railroads can move it. We sure would hate to lose that. Okay, so this will be the only slide I read, and I apologize. Um, what is an inland port? It's, it's real simple. An inland port is an interior land facility that is linked to a seaport by rail. An inland port can speed the flow of cargo between ships and major land transportation networks, creating a more centralized, less congested distribution point. So what we have is basically an inland port. We bring um, imports and execute exports to the ports by containerized freight. And not only do we do it in containerized freight, we do it in flat cars and we do it in um, covered hoppers and we do it in tank cars. So it's a multimodal transportation hub. We talk about the Midwest Inland Port and understanding what the port actually is now. What do we have? Um, I can't stress this enough, it's a multimodal. It's just not about intermodal, it's just not about covered hoppers. Um, it's all of it combined. It's intermodal ramp is a piece of it. Three class one railroads. We have the Norfolk Southern, the CSX, and the Canadian National. So we have three of the seven that connect on 280 acres. And I'll show that to you in a minute. We have five major roadways, the four Eisenhower and US Highway 51, so you can go north, south, east, or west. We have an uh, airport capable of uh, wide body aircraft. And we offer the FTZ, or free trade zone. Um, we're working in the process of getting customs clearing. We have the TIF and enterprise zone and the market proximity. We'll talk about that in a minute. So when you talk about the intermodal container, how many of you ship international containers? Okay. What about domestic containers? 53 foot like Hunt and Schneider's? On the international side, uh, we're set up, uh, and we'll go through the tour, we can handle 20s and 40s. And the really interesting thing about the international container business is this, is the newest form or mode of transportation that is, that is around. It started in the late 50s, and believe it or not, the really cool thing about that 40 foot or 20 foot is if it's made in the US or the Philippines or in China, or anywhere else around the world, the specifications are all the same. So in other words, if I go to lift it off with a crane here in the US, it can lift off with a, a similar type crane in Singapore. So the standardization has made it really grow fast. And it's one of the things that's really flattened the globe out for commerce. And everybody says, well, what moves in containers? Basically, about every good of commerce that you can imagine from calculators to clothing to anything that Walmart or Target or Home Depot or Lowe's has in the store, all that's shipped in containers. In the container world, we have, as we get ready for August and September, we know that there's going to be a lot of imports into the U.S. as the distribution centers, the retail distribution centers gear up for Christmas. So there's a flood of containers that come in. We call that the Christmas season. And then about February, believe it or not, um, right after the Chinese New Year, we have the spring season, and we call it the patio season. And the reason being, as crazy as it sounds, is all this patio furniture moves in. And, and all the exterior living stuff that the Home Depot and the Lowe's and Sears and all those people have in their stores. So for an exporter, we love those seasons because it makes our boxes readily available. Now, are you folks importers or exporters? On your containers? Both. You're an exporter? Both. Perfect. So um, one of the things that we'll talk about is 
he's an importer, you're an exporter, you want to figure out how to try to get his box to help lower your supply chain costs. Okay. Right? You want to be able to flatten your supply chain costs. And I was with a group yesterday from Quincy with the EDC, and we were talking about that, and we had um, a room full of them. And one guy was sitting down here, and, and one guy was sitting down here, and she's struggling to get empty containers. As an exporter, do you struggle to get empty containers sometimes? Haven't yet. Haven't yet, but it happens. And she's struggling, and he's long all these containers, and they, drink, they take them back to Chicago empty, and she goes up to Chicago empty to get the empty one and bring it back down. Yep. Yep. And that works real good if you have ones and twos. But when you do it by the hundreds like we do, it doesn't work so good. <laughs> um, it's, you know, what we found out is, 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 is if, you know, you had a freight council in your region, then you can have these conversations to where transportation people can talk to help flatten their own supply chain costs out, which is healthy for the economy. So the standardized container, which hauls everything, there's millions and millions of them around the globe. And it has been the single um, catalyst for global commerce, flattening it out. Are they tracked? I'm sorry? Are the containers tracked? Yeah, um, some of them are. It depends what the goods are. Uh, not all of them are. They're on the manifest of the ship, obviously. The higher value, the, the container, uh, the contents of the container, Yes, they're probably tracked. And I actually put GPS uh, uh, transponders on the containers now for the high dollar stuff, like cigarettes, <laughs> iPhones. Actually, the railroads do track. Yeah, but I mean, when it's on the vessel, when it's on the uh, vessel, it's on the manifest. And so you lose vi visibility of when that is on the water. And so some companies with high value goods put a transponder on there or in their container where they can always know where it's at. But the but containers themselves don't have their own no. tracking mechanism? No, they're not like a rail car to where they go through a, a ticker and you can, you know, as it passes a station, it goes through the ticker and then it downloads into the railroad and then you can go to steelroads.com to get that. It's not that sophisticated yet. Um, the railroads do um, track and trace them to some degree, but it's only as good as from point A to point B. So if I get it from um, Norfolk, Virginia, and I get it to Chicago, and, and they offload it or they're transloading it uh, to put on to, to go into a different destination, it's tracked there, and so that would be updated. So you don't know really where it's at. You kind of do it sometimes, but it's more of a guess than anything. Um, they're not like a rail car, a covered hopper or a tank car has a I don't know, magnetic, is it magnetic? Magnetic ticker on it. And it's on the side of the rail car. And as it goes by stations, it ticks and automatically downloads into their spreadsheet, and then you can go to their system and you can get, you, can, you know, real time where it's at. That's kind of a downfall of containers. Um, I might add that, I mean, you do have an EPA when the vessel's going to depart when it's going to arrive, so you kind of have some kind of yeah. indication of when it's supposed to be there. Yeah. For your customer overseas to get an idea when this product will arrive. I use GPS uh, transponders and I track the vessel. The map. So my customers where it's at. Yeah, and that's that's a that's a solid way to do it. Um, your car is probably a little more expensive than mine if you're using a GPS transponder. Eight million dollars. Yeah, eight million dollars and mine's worth about thirty thousand. <laughs> Commodity. Yeah, it takes me a lot of containers to get to $8 million. Um, so the typical flow of transportation basically is from the vessel uh, to the rail, to the truck, and back. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So this is a picture of, of the Decatur complex, uh, real close to where you're setting. Um, in the front is the intermodal ramp with the colored containers at the bottom. Um, behind that is... Uh, uh, Decatur's complex, the corn plant. Uh, we have a switching yard to the left, and behind it is a real, um, a real quiet secret that Larry from the EDC is really starting to uh, talk about, and it's called Lake Decatur. And Lake Decatur just went through a 90 million, or is going through a 90 million dollar dredging project to give it 30 percent more capacity. And for those of you, I grew up in the Midwest, and for those of you that are uh, from Midwest origin, we don't really understand the value of water yet, 
But if you go west of the Mississippi very far into Colorado or Dakotas or Kansas or even California, you find out real quick how valuable fresh water is and a readily source of it. So if you're a manufacturing location, um, fresh water is, is going to be a real key to future, to future development. But that's the complex. Um, so we'll talk about the container a little bit. Uh, the container comes into our facility just like it would uh, in, in any other uh, railroad owned uh, facility. And um, it comes through the gate and it's checked by computers and it has the truck, it sets on the, uh, the chassis and then the container is what it says Marisk and that's a 40 foot um, standard international container. So then you can see the tractor and the chassis when we talk about the chassis is the red uh, flat implement that the box sets on. It gets lifted off by a crane um, it stacks onto a rail car, and uh, we have double stack uh, capabilities for efficiencies just like most rail yards. Now when we talk about rail access and we talk about why is Decatur uniquely positioned, it becomes um, really obvious when we put the railroads onto the map. So you look at Decatur, and then you add our friends, the Canadian National, the CN, and we're on the main line that goes down to New Orleans um, for grain and in Memphis for containers. And we can go to the west coast through Prince Rupert or Vancouver if we need to for containers or for bulk grains or tanks or whatever. Or we can go out through Montreal on the east coast. Um, our friends at the CSX, same thing. We got the eastern seaboard covered between New York and Norfolk and, and um, Charleston and Savannah. We can get to those ports um, and we ship out of all those locations from Decatur. Um, you add our friends at Norfolk Southern, they also cover those eastern seaboard. But the thing that al they allow us to do is they allow us to get all the way to Kansas City. And we can connect with the Burlington Northern, the BNSF, and we connect with them in St. Louis and in Kansas City to go to the West Coast. Why is the West Coast so important to us is LA Long Beach is the largest North American container port. In, um, in the, uh, obviously in North America, and it handles about 14 million containers on an annualized basis. The second largest is New York, and the third largest is Savannah. So if we're shipping container freight, we can go east coast or west coast, and we can arbitrage our freight back and forth, figuring out what's going on. Right now, LA Long Beach is very congested because of a potential strike um, on June 30th. We've been shipping some of our product to divert the um, congestion because there's a lot of skip sailings. We've been shipping it via the East Coast and around and completing our supply chains. So the beautiful thing about this is if there's a port strike, if there's a natural disaster, if something happens, you can still get your product and complete your supply chain East Coast or West Coast. Okay, so then um, the railroads on the map and you throw the highways like we talked about, you can go north or south or east or west. Uh, really easy on a four lane highway. And the really cool part about that is, as you guys from Champaign know, there's no tolls. Um, there's no congestion. In our world, 20 miles is 20 minutes. We talked about uh, market access. So in a 10 hour illegal day truck drive from central Illinois, we have 95 million customers, which is very good for containers. So why do we talk about Central Illinois so much and why is it so important? If you look at the rail map, this is the NS rail map. Can you imagine trying to replicate that railroad switchyard in Chicago? Or can you imagine trying to build that and have a railroad build any kind of a complex today on their network and the capital that it would take to build that. We have a huge asset right here, indicator, underutilized, and now we're really making the NS, we're pushing them and making them work. And they love it. Then you throw on the capabilities that you have now with an intermodal ramp. Um, it becomes pretty interesting. So let's talk about the ramp, it's two, it sets on 280 acres. And that 280 acres, it's privately owned. It's owned by ADM. We have an agreement with the EDC of Macon County to operate the ramp for the Midwest Inland Port. So if you want to do an export container out of, out of the ramp, 
you can do that um, through the Midwest Inland Port. Now, the uniqueness about it is the railroads generally own intermodal ramps. Obviously, it's a huge revenue stream for them. And they like to control it. Just because you may set on a railroad siding and, and unload tank cars or bulk cars doesn't mean that you can unload an intermodal ramp. Intermodal ramps are on a specialized network and they're positioned from the railroads in strategic spots to where they can get density of containers, both on the international side and the domestic side. <coughs> Excuse me. So what you have is a privately owned ramp with access to three class one railroads. The CN and the CSX come in, uh, come in on this lead right up here. And the Norfolk Southern comes in on, on, the, on the southerly lead right down here. So what we did, I don't have, uh, what we did was we connected that 280 acre complex basically connected with the intermodal ramp and there's seven other interchange tracks that we connected the CN, the CSX, and the NS together with interchange tracks. So when the NS comes in from the east with a train, they push it in the interchange tracks. We get it, we stage it, and put it over here in the ladder tracks, and we push it into the plants. Vice versa, when they're building a product train, we build the product train on the interchange tracks. It might be half ethanol and half soybean meal. So when the railroad comes in and drops a train off, they go over to the other side, to the other track, and they pick up the loaded train, and they go. They, all they have to do is hook on and they air. So we've created this huge um, infrastructure that basically is train load economics in and out. Huge efficiencies for us, huge efficiencies for the railroad. Now imagine for a minute our bean plant, which is on that side, it's not on the screen, I apologize, was held captive to one railroad, the Norfolk Southern. Imagine for a minute if you, and we, for years we want to go to the CN and we want to go to CSX, but they have a thing called reciprocal switch. And they charge you five or six hundred dollars a car to switch it over to the railroad. Even though they're right there beside it, I'm going to charge you five hundred dollars to go from this rail line to this rail line because I need to get revenue source. It's a paper barrier. That's what it is. They call them railroad paper barriers. And the, the really interesting thing about that is it's, it, it's frustrating because you can see the railroad tracks right beside you and you're like, come on. So when we created this, we now have the bean plant has capabilities to two other class one railroads directly. So our procurement on our raw material just increased by two thirds and our finished product sales just increased, our customer base increased by two thirds. That's huge. Same thing's true for our corn plant. Our corn plant now um, has access, before it was on the south side of the corn plant, could only switch on the Norfolk Southern and the CN and the CSX on the, on the north side. Now we can switch the whole complex, any railroad. So imagine for a minute, um, one of the really cool things is like coal. Coal in the state of Illinois, um, obviously with sulfur constraints, you can't burn 100% Illinois coal, so you have to bring in western coal, which is lower sulfur, and blend it. Now we can bring in coal from the BN into Decatur, and we can bring in NS coal or CSX coal from southern Illinois, bring it up, and we put it in what they do, plant, and they, and they, and they blend it, and we, and we have low sulfur coal and a cheaper cost per MMBTU, and guess what? All because of the complex. Not only do we do that on the raw material side with the grains, but we do the same thing on products. <clears throat> so who's our target market? Local and regional businesses. Um, obviously, all the low-hanging fruit. If the ramp in the Midwest Inland Port has done nothing, it has the biggest factor that it's done, nothing more than the biggest factor has been a catalyst for the community. We're having conversations with people that we never had around us. There's a company that's just down the road from us that imports um, about 10 containers a month. We never even knew it. You see at ADM, we bring a train load of empties every day of containers in to be able to load, to be able to go international to our domestic customers. So we bring these empties in from all over the, um, the eastern seaboard. We bring them in, we load them with a product, and we load them back out. They, they pull out a train and they bring in a train load of empties. And you think, well, an importer of 10 containers is no big deal. That creates a lot less congestion. See, because what was happening was they were importing these containers in. They go up to Chicago. They drive up to Chicago. 
they get their container, they bring it back down here, they strip it, unload it, they take it back to Chicago and they, they just keep repeating the cycle. We did the same thing. Now imagine when we're loading 110 containers a day, how many trucks we took off the road going up to Chicago and down to Chicago every single day. And imagine when we, when we went to our neighbor, which we found out he's importing, and, and now that he brings the containers in through the ramp, they bring the containers in, they offload them, we get the containers back, we load them with material, and it helps the supply chain costs because they don't have the trucking, near the trucking costs that they did, bringing them down from Chicago, nor do I have the origination to get the empty container like I did. So it helped everybody, su suppress everybody's supply chain. So the biggest factor of the Midwest on the port has been a catalyst. The second thing that has really transpired that um, has come under Larry's EDC group and we're really extremely proud of is we're getting everybody involved. It's a collaboration of the local community with citizens and local businesses and government all in one. Before, it didn't really work that way. It was kind of like, well, local businesses or the businesses, they were trying to drive their own business and the citizens were trying to do their own thing and the government was trying to do their own thing. And today, we're in the same library, in the same room, same book, same page, reading the same words because we're funneling all of our energy and focus through the EDC with Larry's tutelage. And we're trying to do things like, you know, if you get a business that comes into central Illinois, um, one of the things we found out is that's great, it, it creates jobs and it, and it creates you know, the, the cycle of cash and everything's good, but they've got to have a place to live. And if they have a family, well, they want to have recreation. So shouldn't they be building uh, new housing areas and parks and, and school districts and things like that at the same time? Absolutely. And Larry and Jennifer and there's a group of them that are all trying to simultaneously keep everybody moving in the same direction. So the collaboration is the second thing that's come out of it, which has been absolutely phenomenal. Larry will talk about that in a minute. International and domestic business. For us, those are definitely targets. I could go on and on and talk about agriculture and give you stats. Um, one of my favorites is, is that, you know, we all know the populations, give or take 7 billion people, and by 2050 it's going to be roughly 20 or uh, um, 9 billion people. We all get that story. But the one that just blows my mind away is to get to there and to nourish those 9 billion people, you have to have a 70% increase in food production. A 70% increase in food production. Think about all the jobs associated with that food production. I get excited when I hear those kind of numbers. And not only that, as we're talking to local businesses, what we're finding out is, is that, and we're talking about businesses that are international, and we're talking about ocean carriers that, like Maersk Line and Mediterranean Shipping and CMA and some of these folks, we're hearing the story that a lot of companies that are overseas are actually looking to get back into North America for their manufacturing. I get pretty excited about that because when you think about manufacturing, it makes up about 16% of, of the global GDP. It makes up about 14% of the jobs. And everybody always says, oh, we've lost that. It's not coming back. Well, one of the local groups... Uh, ran numbers for us, and the product they have, just for the sake of the conversation, is a widget. And they found out, if you make that widget in central Illinois versus China, who makes the widget cheaper? China. China definitely makes it cheaper. But here's the kicker. We all hear that story. But let's take it one step further. What happens when it's delivered to the customer? Now who's cheaper? Goes through their transportation infrastructure to get it to port, to get it delivered to the customer. That same widget is only 4% cheaper coming out of China than Central Illinois. 4% cheaper. Now, I don't know about anybody, but if you, want, you don't want to go through a currency risk or valuation, it's pretty good to be right here. There's a huge push, we're being told, of companies looking to come back into the lower 48 into Mexico in manufacturing. And that's right up our avenue. Because, again, if you think about Joliet and Chicago, Chicago doesn't necessarily want those kind of jobs. They want the big 
retail and the three million square foot retail sectors of Walmart and the new Michelin distribution center. That's great. Let them have that. But what creates value is manufacturing. And when you think about manufacturing and you think about what manufacturing needs, it's all right here in central Illinois. The first thing everybody wants to talk about is utilities. And Larry can talk about utilities better than anybody. But we have that. And then you talk about water. We have it for manufacturing. And then you talk, I was, I was talking to a company, uh, Procter & Gamble, um, the people built a warehouse for them uh, in Lima, Ohio. They built this uh, huge distribution center in Lima, Ohio for Tide. Um, Eighty-some percent, roughly, of the Tide manufactured uh, for North America is made and stored in Lima, Ohio. I said, why in the world Lima, Ohio? Procter & Gamble is based out of Cincinnati. I said, because, well, the first thing they wanted when they built it was they wanted control. They didn't want to go too very far away from, you know, the mothership. I get that. I said, but why? They said, do you know how much water it takes to make Tide? I'm like, oh, I get it. There's a huge water source with the lakes and the reservoirs and the aquifer that's there in Lima that they never run out of water. I'm like, makes sense. There's 800 trucks a day that go out of that facility with Tide. And I said, so was rail even a consideration or what was it? And they said, for us, it was being close, having control, and the water. Utilities and infrastructure really wasn't, really wasn't in the play at the time. And I think about Decatur and I think about what you have in central Illinois and I get pretty excited because even though I'm a Buckeye, I kind of get excited for this place, right Larry? Yes, I do. Um, when I think about what we have and I think about Decatur and I think about multimodal, because today companies just aren't looking, especially as manufacturing companies are coming in, they're not looking for single mode of transportation. I want you to think about if you're building a manufacturing plant, um, do you want to be truck in and truck out? Or do you want to have the ability to have rail in and truck out? Or do you want to have the ability to truck in intermodal domestic or intermodal out to hit a broader spectrum of customers? Or do you want to do, what's the combination you want to do? That's what's so awesome about it. And, I, and, and in my narrow mind, I get excited because I just get excited about 70% increase by 2050 on food production. And I think about the global middle class. And I think about in Asia, you know, uh, by 2030, they're going to be over 2 billion people middle class with a lot of discretionary uh, income. And I get excited because they're going to spend it. And then you start hearing the story from overseas and you start listening to the steamship lines. They talk about manufacturing coming back into the U.S. Things look pretty good. And I know what's happening right now today. And I, think, I sat there and think to myself, Holy cow, we, if this happens, we'll never be able to, you know, the railroads can't keep up. We don't have enough truckers. And how many of you have, have heard about the trucker shortage in North America? How's that working for you? Pretty good? <laughs> Doing a lot of training. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, because let's face it, um, Susie, and, we don't want Susie and Billy, you know, to grow up to be truck drivers because it, it, it's it got a bad rap over the years. These are great paying jobs that, I mean, if you look at trucking companies across the country, they can't find drivers. Nobody wants to do the job because it's over the road and they're gone from home and, you know, what's happening to trucking rates because of that? They're going up. So Jennifer and Larry got the bright idea, wait a second, if we're going to have a multimodal intermodal ramp, we better figure out how to get truckers. I'm like, yeah, that's a good idea. So they, they teamed up with a local, the local, the uh, local, uh, college and they said here here's what we need to do and they got together and they got them a truck and a trailer and they've, they've, they've got a program now to where they're training drivers see because we need those drivers not just at ADM but we need them in central Illinois our ocean freight rates and most people's are if you look at your ocean freight rate just the ocean piece it's a small piece of your transportation cost your inland costs are probably double to triple your ocean piece. Easily. Today, if you're shipping scrap paper or bulk grains or something that's a base commodity, 
I can go from Chicago, Illinois, all the way to mainland China for about $1,150 all in in a container, 40 footer. $1,100. So my mind already thinks if I could ship my family a four over there, put a table and chairs in there, <laughs> we could have a cheap vacation. I can't fly, I can't literally fly to California now for under 700 bucks. But you can take 58,000 pounds for, rough, for under $1,200. That's the power of the container. Not only that, when you think about the things that they're doing with the local community and, and, they're, and they're trying to build these pillars and education is a piece of it, I look at railroads and I think to myself, how will they keep up with demand for agriculture production and manufacturing and, and the oil production that's happening all across the country, especially in the Balkan area? And I think, how do we keep up with that? How do we attract these international customers and in our, in, in, in our domestic businesses to add into central Illinois? Multimodal. How do I keep my cost of my cost of goods sold down for my customers and keep competitive? Today, when we talk about the intermodal ramp, the strategy is any customer, anytime, anywhere. I'm proud to tell you that we execute that every single day, and we're getting into places of the globe we never have before with products we never have offered or been in that region with these particular products because of transportation. When I can sell more product on a global basis, I can run the products, I can run the plants harder. Commerce happens. We can buy more raw material, which is good for our farmer friends. They can get a better basis, increased value to them, and on and on and on. So I get pretty excited when I talk about the opportunities just, just globally. But we also, um, the real, the real thing we're trying to make sure that happens is we get a good mix of importers and exporters. Central Illinois is really set up for huge exporters. We have a great exporters, but we don't have a lot of importers. We do up north, we do in various regions, but we're trying to figure out how to create that match back to lower supply chain, take the waste out of supply chains and, and reduce costs. We talked about it, you know, what's the result? Bottom line, ancillary effect of commerce. What can we do to add value? How can we talk to people that we've never talked with in our business before, um, and how can we add value to them? You see, today we ship containers uh, all over the place out of Decatur, Illinois, to go to our international customers. They have to be a food grade container. Not all of the containers, believe it or not, that come in, that get repositioned in Decatur, are food grade. If Caterpillar brings in a container, and it comes, for, for prime example, it has exactly happened. It came in from Brazil, it had uh, new parts in it, and it smelled like paint, because they were painted. That paint smell, we can't ship food product in. They have to go through a, uh, very rigorous inspection process to be able to be food grade ready, and it didn't meet, it didn't meet the uh, qualifications. So we had an empty container, that didn't meet our specifications, what do we need to do? We have, uh, we have many local companies that uh, in town that can export that don't have food grade. One of them is Midwest Fiber. We use Midwest Fiber who, who ships waste paper back to China. He doesn't care. I didn't care if there's a gas stain in there or smells like paint. There's no standard qualifications for his waste paper. But for my food, there is. So Ronnie loads them up for us. Whenever we get a container rejected, he loads them up. Instead of going to Chicago, he loads it up here. We put it on the ramp, and it goes to China along with our grain. We're trying to create solutions and then match back. I really don't like the word, but it really is a win-win situation. Um, we're trying to create matchbacks and, and lower the supply chain between the import and export customers. It's good for the local community and, and the economy. Again, it's not about Decatur. It's about Central Illinois. 
how can we help people with supply chain, um, looking at the supply chain. I don't promise that the Midwest Inland Port is going to be everything to everybody. It's not. It may not be the same to you as it is you or you. It may not work for you, but I guarantee one thing. It'll be a solid benchmark for you to be able to figure out, is my supply chain cost in check? Am I looking at the right modes of transportation and am I getting the value that I should be getting? Every single day, Midwest Inland Port is an awesome metric for freight. Of course, we talk about transportation companies. It's a great solution for transportation companies. One of the things that we had going on when we created Midwest Inland Port was creating synergies between the railroads. Now think about what we've done. We basically created what Chicago had, except we have 280 acres that connects three class one railroads and you've created, we move empty containers and imports from New York. We bring them into Decatur. They get stripped off. We reload them and they go to LA Long Beach. What you've created is a transcontinental railroad. And the ocean carrier, Where's his biggest density for containers? L.A. Long Beach. He wants them back in L.A. Long Beach because his haul into the U.S. normally comes out of Asia. Comes out of everywhere, but the bulk of his hauls come out of Asia. So he wants them back in L.A. Long Beach because he can get them to get his head haul in China very quickly. Taxpayers. This is my favorite. Think about all the trucks that we took off the road. We used to go up to Chicago, pick up the empty container, bring it back here, load it, take it back to Chicago loaded, keep repeating that cycle. 85 times a day. Today, we put it on private infrastructure. We put it on the railroad. We put it in the Midwest Inland Port. We put it on the ramp. We put it in the railroad. And guess what? We take them trucks off the road, which is taxpayers' infrastructure. And you all know as well as I do, potholes are not becoming less. They're becoming more. It's a good solution. And of course the environment. Look at the savings on fuel, moving them on train versus rail. Will County is basically Joliet. When we think about Will County, we think about their park um, that they've done. We, asked, we went up there and we asked them, we said, what was your strategy when you built Will County, when you built the intermodal yard? We didn't have a strategy. It just happened. And it was that old, you know, when, you, when you're talking to a realtor, what do they tell you? Location, location, location. And you see, Will County was right in the right location at the right time for the success to happen. Because Chicago said, hey, guys, don't be jammed up downtown Chicago in the tri-state with all these trucks. Get them out. Get that, get that stuff out and get it with a railhead further out. They didn't have a marketing plan. We're the reverse story of that. We don't have the retailers that are coming in because we don't have that, per, you know, that, that, that base of people. But what we have is the ability for real estate and manufacturing. And the success of 20 miles equals 20 minutes. 